My name is Jessie Rathburn, and I am the Earth Education and Advocacy Coordinator for the Loretto Community. I am coming to you from our Loretto Motherhouse grounds here in Loretto, Kentucky. And I want to welcome you on behalf of the Loretto Earth Network and the Loretto Motherhouse Farm and Land Managing Committee. These are two groups that have been long active in Loretto. The Loretto Earth Network, or LEN for short, um, has focused on community-wide education and eco-spirituality for about 30 years. And the Farm and Land Management Committee really looks at the nuts and bolts of daily management at the Mother House Farm of our 788 acres here. And though the focus of these groups um, has been rather different over the years, together we see the incredible benefits of regenerative agriculture, both on a very practical level, on a communal level, at a, and on a spiritual level. And um, we see much of this reflected in the film, Kiss the Ground. So we're very happy to come together and welcome you to this evening. If you want to get connected, more connected with either of these groups, there are a few ways that you can do that. Um, the Loretto Earth Network has a list serve on which we send out a variety of messages, um, like advertising things like tonight, for, for instance, or if there are resources that we think are particularly helpful. So if you want to be part of that list serve and get those email messages, I'm going to ask you to put your email address in the chat. You don't have to do it publicly. You can just do it privately to me and just put the letters L-E-N first with the colon and then your email address. And that'll tell me that you want me to add you to the LEN listserv. If you want to follow the Mother House Farm, you can do that on Facebook. Just search for Loretto Mother House Farm. And um, we have a very active Facebook account. Our farm dog, Rascal, manages that for us. So, um, and I'm sure that Angela is going to put uh, more information about that in the chat as well. Um, we are recording the, the meeting tonight, as you know, so this will be available on the Loretto Community website and the Loretto Community YouTube channel. Um, and we just ask you to follow reg regular Zoom etiquette to keep yourself muted. Feel free to turn your camera on or off, whatever you're most comfortable with. Susan Claussen is our Zoom master tonight. So if you have any questions or are having trouble, just send her a private message in the chat if you um, know how to do that. If you have her, her number and you need to give her a call, please do that as well. I also just wanna express our gratitude to Rocco Films, the creators of Kiss the Ground who made the film available to all of us at free of charge and um, who provided some support materials for this evening. So um, they are really trying to get the word out there about regenerative agriculture. And we are very, very grateful for them for creating the film and for giving us access to it. We are living in a time in which we see the planetary crisis that we are facing in multiple ways daily, through extreme weather events, global warming, species loss, and displacement of many people from their homelands. As we learned in the film, Kiss the Ground, we are also seeing this planetary crisis in the health of our soils. We learned that desertification of our soils is a threat to our climate and to our species. Every year, 40 million people are pushed off their land. And by 2050, it is estimated that 1 billion people will be refugees of soil desertification. While we often wonder what we as humans can do in response to this huge crisis that we face, sometimes for we forget that we have a partner. We are in fact part of a living system that kept itself in balance for millennia. By engaging with earth in a regenerative fashion, we can play a role in seeing biodiversity to return to places that have been completely devastated. And that is what the film Kiss the Ground teaches us. By tracing the roots of the desertification of much of earth, we also learned how we might play a role in healing the land and balancing the climate. It is true that the situation is dire. As we learned in the film, according to the UN, the world's remaining topsoil will be gone within 60 years. That is 60 more harvests unless we find a way to save our soils. The good news is that we know what to do. Our species faces its biggest test, 
to harness the regenerative power of Earth itself. If you have not been able to view the film, I hope you can do so soon. And if you need help um, connecting or viewing that film, we can help you do that. Just drop a message in the chat. If you have seen the film, I'm sure you have questions you would like to submit for our panelists this evening. We're going to begin by introducing each of the panelists in turn and allowing them five minutes to talk a bit more about their farm particularly in the context of what we learned from Kiss the Ground. We have um, three very different panelists today spread out both geographically and different in their farming context. So we wanted to provide a variety of voices um, to talk about regenerative agriculture in different locations and on different scales. So following those introductions and those five minute um, segments, I will moderate a question and answer time with our panelists. Some of you have submitted questions in advance. Thank you for that. So we will start with those. If you have questions for our panelists, just go ahead and drop them in the chat and we will ask as many as we can. I also wanna make sure panelists that you remember that if you have questions for each other, I want you to jump in there too and have dialogue with each other as well. Um, our goal tonight is to end between 8.15 and 8.30, so I will make sure that um, we get out on time this evening so we can all get to bed at a reasonable time or go have a late supper. Um, but again, I just want to thank you for coming tonight, and um, I'm now going to start with um, one of our panelists. We didn't talk about who was going to go first, so I'm just going to go with the first one on my list here. So first, I'm going to introduce Vel Scott. Vel is an entrepreneur, advocate, and grassroots leader in Cleveland, Ohio, in the movement to bring nutrition and healthy living into the lives of all people. Through her workshops, lectures, and cooking demonstrations, she teaches that food can be the catalyst for better, better living. Vel's passion and purpose is educating people in how to live their best lives by powering their bodies with healthy food. And you can read more about Vel's Purple Oasis at her website, um, velscott.com. Vel spoke with the Loretto Earth Network earlier this year. So thank you again for engaging with us in this way tonight, Vel. Um, go ahead, you've got five minutes to tell us a little bit more about yourself and your farm. It's a pleasure, I'm Vel Scott. I presently live in Cleveland, Ohio, but I'm a transplant from Vicksburg, Mississippi. And I grew up on a farming, uh, in a farming family, farming community. And it was interesting after watching the film, so much of what I saw were things that my grandparents and great grandparents did many years ago. However, I must admit, it didn't have a name. So finding out that there is a name in the regenerative farming, um, I'm gonna be very anxious tonight to, to hear what the other panelists are gonna say and how it fits into um, what they do and in, my community. So uh, I'm delighted to be a panelist here. Those Purple Oasis is on an acre of land in an urban area in Cleveland, Ohio. But after being there for the last uh, eight, 10 years farming on it, it feels like I'm back in Mississippi. So thank you. Thank you so much, Bell. Um, next, I would like to introduce uh, Stephen Kokener. And Stephen, if I'm pronouncing your last name incorrectly, please correct me. Um, Stephen has been working at the intersection of community-focused food production and our human kinship with place for over a decade. They currently work as the instructor and farm manager at Warren Tech's Farm to Table program in Lakewood, Colorado, which gives high school students authentic experience and education in agriculture through the school's farm. Along with teaching, Stephen loves back porch conversations with their spouse, kitchen dance parties with their oldest daughter, and playing Legos with their youngest daughter. Welcome, Stephen. Thanks so much. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Tell us a little bit more about who you are. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, my name is Stephen Kokenauer. And um, first, just I, I want to express my gratitude for being invited to participate. So Jesse, appreciate the invitation and the ongoing communication about um, getting me here. And Val and Cody, I'm, I'm grateful to be on this panel with you both. Um, I live in the historic territories of the Ute and the Arapaho and the Cheyenne people, which is now 
referred to as Colorado and the front range of Colorado outside of Denver. Um, I've been farming for about 15 years and um, all of that has been out in this high plains desert of Colorado, uh, which is mostly ironic because I grew up in the Midwest in the deep rich soils of Wisconsin. And yet that was not a part of what I thought I was gonna be doing, but here I am. Um, my, this program that I'm teaching, um, although I've been a part of it, I was on the advisory board for this particular school program for several years. It, um, the opportunity showed up last January for me to start teaching here. So I have been doing my own uh, production agriculture, primarily focused on small fruits and vegetables. Um, and now I'm teaching this high school program, which is a really unique program. Um, I have uh, a small group of students for the entire school year. And our classroom is a three acre farm outfitted with two large green commercial scale greenhouses, um, a freight container that's converted into a hydroponic system, and then a couple acres of in-ground vegetable, fruit and vegetable production. And so my role is to give the students real life agriculture experience. And for me, the reason I'm doing it is because I think um, I want my students to recognize that we, we as people can have a relationship with thing with with non-people and it makes a difference um, and so we talk a lot about relationship we talk about agriculture through the lens of relationship in fact we're i'm having my students right now working on a unit where they're going back and studying the history of agriculture but adding this layer of relationship and asking them, what do you see? What do you see if you think about agriculture as a system of relationships? And how is that maybe different than what you learned about in history class at some point? So this, this relationship between the human and the non-human kin is really important to me. And uh, I'm grateful to be in a, in a high school setting where I get to introduce this to my students. So um, yeah, and I, um, like Val mentioned, these concepts of regenerative agriculture have been a part of my way of understanding agriculture since I really got involved. Um, and I think that's uh, a unique piece for me because I didn't grow up with agriculture. Like my family, I have to go back a few generations to find the more, most recent farmer um, who was a matriarch in, in my family. Um, but so to be able to learn agriculture through this other lens um, has been really valuable to me. And so I'm excited to see what, to hear what the other panelists say and, and engage with you all tonight. And I'm really grateful to be here. So thank you. Thank you. Our final panelist this evening is Cody Rakes. Cody is the Director of Farm and Land Development at the Loretto Motherhouse Farm. Cody can be found managing the day-to-day -day operations of the farm while also balancing budgets and staying engaged in numerous education programs. He serves on several local and state boards, including the Marion County Water District and the Kentucky Forage and Grasslands Council. Cody is always learning and finding creative ways to move the farm forward. So welcome, Cody, and please go ahead and uh, say a little bit more about yourself and your farming operations here at the Mother House. Well, hello, everybody, and thank you, each and every one of you, for taking the time to be interested in this topic. Um, this is something that is extremely important to me, um, and, and I think to the other panelists as well. And by you being here, um, it shows that, that, that it's important to you as well. Uh, Vail and, and Stephen, thank you for the comments that you've made thus far. Um, I had a few things I wanted to, to talk about, but uh, uh, Stephen, you mentioned the relationships, and that is really uh, resounded with me. Uh, 
that's something that I that I in my educational efforts on the farm talk a lot about with with the people that pass through is building relationships. Now, typically, I'm talking about relationships with a farmer, um, but but at the core of it, it's the relationships. And if you look at the word agriculture, culture is the biggest part of that word, right? And so so looking at the culture and the relationships and and all those kind of things is is really important. Um, a little bit about myself, I am born and raised right here in Marion County, uh, where the, the Loretta Mother House is, Central Kentucky. Uh, this is this is home to me. My wife grew up about four miles away from the Loretta Mother House, and I grew up about oh, 20 miles the other direction. Um, Marion County is kind of like a big rectangle, and we're on opposite corners, grew up on opposite corners of that rectangle. So uh, I, made, I made lots of trips past the Loretta Mother House in our high school dating years, before I ever even realized what that place was. Um, and so soon after I graduated from University of Kentucky with a degree in agriculture education and a minor in plant and soil science, I had the opportunity to apply for this, this job as, as the director of farm and land management at the Loretta Mother House. And I said, well, I'm not sure what the Loretta Mother House is, but it's in Loretto. That's pretty close to home. That's a, that's a, that's a, a no brainer. You know, I need to try out for that. And, uh, they asked me to join their team and uh, I've been very happy to be a part of the team because I have been able to practice some of the thoughts that I've had. I grew up in agriculture, but uh, the agriculture that I grew up in was very similar to the first portion of the video that you watched. Tillage, um, it was not a regenerative system. It was a extractive system we were taking away and not giving back and um, i've been really happy to spend the past six years developing a regenerative system in which we practice intensive managed rotational grazing cover cropping uh, we're practicing the tenets of keeping the soil covered keeping armor on the soil uh, not tilling the soil keeping the soil from being disturbed keeping a living root in the soil 365 days a year and increasingly working on animal integration. We haven't gotten animals integrated on every acre, but it's a, it's a process. <laughs> um, so really excited for the opportunity to talk about these things tonight. And uh, one comment that I wanna make before I forget is that in a book that Gabe Brown wrote called um, Dirt to Soil, he talks about that the fact that soil is dirt that is infused with life. And he doesn't come out and explicitly say this, but what he's, what he's getting at is regenerative agriculture puts the life in the soil. And that's what we're really all about is putting the life back in the soil. Thank you all. Um, that is a perfect segue to our first question. And I do hope that, um, if you have more questions for everybody who's watching tonight, please do just go ahead and put those in the chat and we will get to um, hopefully all of your questions. But I think each of you mentioned the word relationship in your own way. And so I wanna start by talking about relationships this evening um, and looking at what is that relationship between human health, soil health and planetary health? What does, what does that look like in a regenerative agriculture system? Um, how important is that to you in your own farming practices? Who would like to jump in and go first? Um, I'll start off and, and specifically talk about the soil health part. Um, the, the regenerative practices to me are, are all about the soil health. I mean, that's, that's, that's what it all starts with. Um, when we're doing the educational events that we do at the farm, you know, that's, that's how we get the draw in. That's how we get the farmers in the local area interested in the practices that we're doing is the soil health. And we get them interested in the soil health because we can show that improving your soil health returns dividends to your operation. By increasing your soil health, you have more water holding capacity. You're able to withstand drought situations more, uh, more effectively than in a, in a tillage system uh, in, in a system that is not regenerative. Um, so when we can talk dollars and cents about 
the practices and how they dollars and cents make sense. That's how farmers become uh, interested and that's how farmers are able to take advantage of these practices. For, for most farmers, the warm and fuzzy feeling of knowing that you're doing a better job does not pay the bills. And, and at the end of the day, the bills have to be paid. And so being able to show these regenerative practices, improving the soil health, then leads to dollars and cents that actually make the farm better able to pay its bills. And, and that's really the, the crux of the matter. Now, then you get all these other extrinsic, extrinsic benefits like soil carbon capture, and uh, you're improving the, the water cycling and, and all these other things that are, that are going on. But ultimately at the end of the day, if it helps pay farmers bills, that's how the practices are gonna be adopted. Listening to the other two panelists, it's interesting that um, with my background, I sort of backed into, and I can't say that it's really farming, we started out with a garden. My background, I'm a former court reporter, uh, nightclub entertainment owner. Um, we needed extra parking. And my husband and I had a couple of acres of land across the street, which we didn't need for parking. So we decided um, in about 15 years ago, because we had this restaurant that could seat four or 500 people on a given uh, event, that we should grow our own food. Coming from the South, my husband figured, well, you're from Mississippi, so you should know a lot about um, the land and the soil. I said, well, that's, first of all, that's inaccurate, you know, because leaving Mississippi as a youngster, I was in the garden. I did watch my grandparents and great grandparents grow um, all of the food that we had. We did have animals on the farm. That was more of a farm than what we have now. Vell's Purple Oasis Garden is more of an educational uh, component where we're in the heart of um, the inner city. We're near what we call University Circle where the art museum, Severance Hall, all of the large institutions are there. But when you cross the, it's almost like in the South when you cross the railroad tracks and you come into a whole other community. So what we have done is to, many people are lower income, don't have access to um, a lot of grocery stores in the area. So what I did was to create a setting where people could, we could grow, teach people how to grow their own vegetables and their fruits, and then how to prepare the meals, because that was a big thing. We have many preventable diseases that run rampant in our community high blood pressure, congestive heart failure, gout, strokes, cancer, all of those things. So the first thing was to teach people that to eat real food. You have to take them step by step. I couldn't go from um, regenerative agriculture to a, a community that has everyday concerns about, you know, where's my next meal going to come from after the, after the first of the month, by the 15th or almost the 30th, we're out of food. So how to make use of what you have, how to plant cabbage, how to plant collard greens, and how to make those into a meal that would last um, for the week and that would be, um, would be healthy, that would stretch a grain, a rice, whole grains. So that's the point, that's where we are with teaching people how to make do with what they have, how to use the local resources, the next step for us is to be able to educate them about building the soil. It's something that we have done, but you have to start at you know A, B, C. You can't go from A to Z and expect the people where in the community to just jump in. So it's more of an education component. So it's interesting that as far um, what they're doing with their farming and hopefully in the next couple of years or so, we will have more people in the community that will grow their own food and that will learn from, as I've sit with the panelists tonight, the more I learn about the term regenerative ag, the more I'll be able to teach it and the more I'll be able to show it that it's right here in your own backyard. Uh, another interesting thing is that we always, we from the South, 
taking care of our soil. We didn't have the tools or the money to till. So this was all done by hand, you know, with shovels and that kind of thing. So we've taken care of the soil, making sure that the carbon is there and that it's regenerative. So that's one of the things that we were doing. And as my grandmother would say, unbeknownst to us, we were doing this. I didn't know what it was called at that time. So that's um, where we are. We're teaching, we're educating uh, a community that sorely needs to live a healthier lifestyle and to be able to uh, know where the food comes from. Thank you, Belle. Stephen, would you like to jump in here and talk any more at all about the idea of relationship between human health, soil health, and planetary health? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, I, I think it's really great that um, for whatever, uh, however, whatever made it work to get both Val and Cody and I here, I think we cover like a really interesting spectrum of, of how we can actually all approach this, um, which is really, yeah, that's really exciting. Um, my, I have a degree in, in horticulture and food crop production um, from Colorado State University. And then a bit of time went by and I, I ended up doing a master's degree um, in a discipline called eco-psychology through Naropa University. And eco-psychology is, you know, a fancy academic term because that's what you have to do when you're in academia is come up with new things so you can create new disciplines. But um, it, for me, it was a discipline that studies humans as nature. And it's really relatively recent in human history that we as a species consider ourselves so far removed from everything else. And so this question of the relationship between soil health and human health and community health and biospheric health to me feels like one of remembering like this relationship between us and the landscape that feeds us is in our bones we were born into it but our cultural memory has kind of diminished that quite a bit and to me, that's a really exciting thing because I think when we get to have conversations with people and we can invite these things of, of recognizing how we feel different in our bodies when we're in different places, right? I imagine, Vel, you've got folks coming off of the concrete who just start to relax when they come into your garden. Yes, right? absolutely. And and Cody, I bet it's, it's sim in a similar way. When you've got farmers in the area that are, are, are stuck in the wheel of conventional agriculture who see a different way possible and see that it's maybe possible even for them, like there's this, oh, like relaxing that can happen. Because I think that's in all of us. Like that's our bone memory of what it means to be human is to be in relationship with place. And... And so I think that is part of this work of regenerative agriculture. It's not just regenerating the soil, but it's this regeneration of our own humanness of, of, of our relationship to our place. And so, uh, yeah, I think that's a, big, that's a big piece for me. And my students have to elect to come into this program. They've got to apply to it. It's, um, it's not for everybody. And so these students are coming in because they have an interest in agriculture, which in a, a suburban, peri-urban environment is, is tough. Um, but this is one of the primary things that I'm trying to instill in them is it, I do a disservice if all you learn about is carrots and broccoli. If you don't know that you, you're, you as the farmer impact the farm, then I've done a disservice to you because that is this, this regenerative um, human way of relating to our, our agricultural systems. Um, as Stephen said, it is very relatively recent 
in human history that we do think of ourselves as separate from earth in some way. And there is this, um, we also unfortunately have a long history in the US of um, co-opting um, indigenous knowledge or um, knowledge from communities of color. Things like permaculture are branded as a new practice, but the fundamentals of those practices um, trace back to Native American communities that um, they've been using for thousands of years. So, and, and Vel, like you just said, you, your family was practicing regenerative agriculture before it was called that, unbeknownst to you. That's what you all were doing um, by necessity. And so I'm wondering if we could, if you could talk a little bit about how can we be conscientious of this and not wanting to co-opt these um, traditions while also wanting to engage in regenerative agriculture and to farm in a way that is better for people and better for earth. Well, in my community, uh, I would say that the first piece, as I said earlier, is the knowledge piece. The relationship building um, is a great piece. And when we started the garden, there are maybe a dozen or more families who have lived in this community for their fourth generation, two or three families. So 30, 40, 50, 60 years that really didn't know each other. When the garden came into being and I went and knocked on doors and asked people you know, to come and um, work in the garden, you know, what we'll cook, I have portable cooking equipment. We'll cook some of the food that's out there, you know, once we harvest, um, we'll have music. It, building relationships is what we really did. And once that was done, some of the families connected. There was one family, just a husband and wife who were um, way up in, up in age in their nineties, who had no children. So one of the young men, young men being in his fifties, sort of um, took them on as an extended family. And it was through the soil, through the weeding, through the watering that they made this connection. And in making the connection, once the people get to know each other and begin to trust each other and care for each other, then that's when we can really build community. And that's unless you, we build the community, then we can't get people to be involved in just coming out to be weeding or to watering or whatever it is. But once they find out that you're interested in them, that you care about them, uh, that culture piece is there, then that's when um, the opening up of the mind, body and spirit comes. That's when they take that deep breath and says, wow, it's fun out here. You know, it's a nice breeze. You know, that's when the relationship buildings and that's when the work starts building, not only in the relationships with each other, but in connecting with the soil. Um, something that, that uh, I hope everybody noticed in the film is when Gabe Brown was talking about what got him into regenerative agriculture. He talked about those four seasons with no income. You know, he had three years, two years of hail, three years of hail. Anyway, he had a terrible start to his farming career back in the early 90s. And so he became a, uh, a student of the soil. And what he sort of began to investigate was, well, how in the world did farmers do all of this before we had the synthetic inputs and the equipment to do all of this tillage and those all of those kinds of things and so that's what led him down the path of the regenerative agricultural system and so what he found was diversity and when you look into the the so, the the seed bank that is in those those native prairie soils you find f hundreds of species of different grasses and forbs and all kinds of different things that contribute to that diverse uh, ecosystem from years and years ago. And while it is important to sort of give credit 
to the tradition of the prior practice, I think it's more important to reinvigorate it and bring it back to life and, and breathe some life into that practice that can continue us moving forward. Because there's going to be lots of things that we are going to relearn. Um, and sometimes it takes relearning something a couple of times before it really sticks. And uh, there's going to be lots of things that we're going to learn that somebody else had already learned before. Um, so just being willing to breathe the life back into those, those practices like permaculture. Um, you know, we all know the story of the, the three sisters and the, the indigenous uh, Native Americans and, and the corn and the squash and the beans. Um, you know, how, how, can we, how can we utilize those practices that worked for them and going forward in, in our current modern day systems uh, to, to be regenerative and to, to heal the, the earth that we all call home. I, I, um, this, may, this may be a little, maybe a little less relevant to the broader group of folks that's assembled here today, but, but maybe it'll, it'll serve as an example to this question of like, how, do we, how do we navigate um, uh, how do we navigate the spaces where we've got, you know, new terms like regenerative agriculture that's based on principles that have been around for a long time, um, especially around communities that have been marginalized by the dominant culture. Um, and one of the things that I see that that's really common in some agricultural spaces is the need to um, trademark ideas. And um, if you spend any time on farm Instagram accounts, like you see pretty quickly, who's trying to sell something to somebody. Um, they got their all their perfect farm pictures with their, uh, you know, free introductory courses to learn how to farm like they do. And then you can sign up for their eight week course. I don't know when these farmers are able to take a course in farming because there's never ending work. But anyways, then you got to pay for the course to figure out how to do it. Um, and I think one of the big things for me is that that helps me stay centered in am I being responsible with information is am I acting as a gatekeeper to it? Am I hoarding this information? Or am I giving it as freely as I can? Because when I study various indigenous cultures from around the world, there seems to be a common theme of when you understand something, you give it away. That sense of reciprocity between yourself and your community. And, and to be honest, there is a lot in regenerative agriculture that is not given in reciprocity. There are people out there trying to, to sell regenerative agriculture as another commodity. And it's a really painful thing to see uh, because it, it may take something that could have power, could have language power, could have a term you know, that this film was built around um, and, and denude it like our soils currently are. Take the life out of it because it's, it's being grasped too tightly for control. And so that, I think that's a piece that sits with me a lot is what are we doing with this information? Are we giving it freely in a, in a spirit of generosity and reciprocity? Because in most of these cases, we don't, these, these ideas of regenerative agriculture aren't coming from us, right? They're coming out of our relationship to the soil. Like Gabe Brown mentions in the film, that Cody referenced, right? He's his four years, he needed to learn something. And, and although he was doing external study, he was looking at what, what the soil needed in his specific location. And so I think that's, that's a big piece um, to guard us against our, uh, whether or not we're being um, integrous with what we're doing. 
is, is are we holding it too closely? Are we trying to um, profit from something that should be freely given? In marginalized communities, how do we get this information out? Uh, I was told many years ago, you only get to keep what you give away. The information um, that your things you're talking about, I don't know what the um, breakdown of your students or the schools are that you're teaching, but how many of uh, the students are from different backgrounds? How, how, how do we get the information in the communities that um, could benefit from all of this information that you have? Once we find out sustainability, you know, all of these terms that come into our community, into my community, and before we can get a handle on what sustainability is, now we're talking about regenerative ag. So what does that mean to um, people in the, in the community where I live? What, what does that really mean? Uh, and how do we become a part of that? How, how, do we, how do we have a relationship with that? By the time we get one term under our belt, there's another one that's out there. So how, do, how does this become inclusive? How does it really build a relationship and not just for all people and not just for a select few. Vail, I think that is a, is a great question. I do not have an answer for that question. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and I don't think, I don't think it's a rhetorical question. It's a, it's a question that needs, that needs some work done on it. Um, I mean, I can tell you that, that the, the field days, the events that I have for local farmers in rural central Kentucky are they're all white folks um there are black farmers in the area uh are they practicing regenerative practices I, I don't know do they know what regenerative practices are I don't know um that's something that we are are working on is building relationships with some local uh BIPOC folks that that are doing practices along the same ways that we feel that we feel tied to they are raising pastured chickens they are doing pastured pork they are doing rotational grazing they're they're doing a lot of these regenerative practices um but i also wanted to to mention Stephen, uh, you the nail on the head i mean being a gatekeeper of this knowledge is not using it responsibly and and i totally agree that that is an issue that's out there when, when you see these programs um gabe brown that was in the film he is part of a uh national organization i think it's called understanding ag or or something along those lines um i mean they charge farmers hundreds of dollars like 300 dollars for a two-day workshop to come and and hear their their um their trade secrets, right? Well, it's it's information that anybody can figure out. Why why should should they uh, hold the keys to that information? You know, if 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 that information can really make substantial impact, um, so that's something that's concerning to me as well, and something that we we have figured into the programming that we're doing at the farm is we feel strongly about not charging for the events that we put on um, up to this date we have not charged for any of the the educational events that we have conducted uh, we have seek, sought some outside sponsorship to cover the cost of meals and those sorts of things um, and i feel strongly about continuing doing it that way and we also are partnering with national organizations that are um, are are freely sharing their information like the soil health partnership through the nature conservancy and the uh, national corn growers association so that's that's a that is a program that i am one of the partner farmers for where we're doing a a 25 acre uh, replicated strip plot for a cover cropping seeding practice 
and that information is being shared with, uh, conglomerated with about 200 farmers from across the U.S., and that information is freely shared. However, it's not dispersed well enough. And how do we get that information out there? Those are some big questions. Don't know the answer to them, but it's things that we need to work on. I'm gonna jump in here with another big question, if I may, and this one also probably doesn't have an easy answer, um, but we have received several questions about the role of animals in regenerative agriculture from a few different perspectives. So um, uh, some questions around drought and in areas that are particularly hit hard by drought out in the West, Colorado, New Mexico, California, um, wouldn't it make wouldn't it be wiser to just focus on vegetable production instead of meat production or focusing on um, raising crops to feed animals instead of raising produce to feed people? So that's one aspect of the questions. Another aspect is, um, is, is meat production really the best use of of land, how many people can afford to pay for the cost of everything that's involved in raising cattle or other forms of livestock in terms of the amount of land needed to support herds um, and in terms of the resources required um, for those animals. So um, lots of different questions about the role of animals in agriculture, in regener regenerative agriculture systems in particular. So um, who would like to jump in? There's lots of ways that, <laughs> that you could respond to this. <laughs> Y'all are coming out swinging with these questions. You're like stirring the pot up. Um, I, I, it's complicated. There are not easy answers to these things. And I think we, I, I just want to say, I think we do a disservice if we assume that there's an easy answer out there that we should, like, that we all just need to get on board with. And I think some people, this question of animals and livestock and agriculture, um, some people are going to come down on the, the side of um, animals in agriculture are the biggest problem that we have. And so we need to remove animals from agriculture. We need to all um, move away from from that, other people are going to see animals in agriculture um, as a way forward in 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 regenerative systems. Uh, but I think that the dogma of strict one way forward puts us in a real delicate place of trying to maintain relationships. Um, so with that, I'm trying to cushion my answers best I can. <laughs> To be honest, when I started farming in Colorado, every year I wonder, why are we doing this? Why are we as people living here on a landscape that wasn't historically holding people year after year after year after year after year? Um, we, have to, we have to shift the landscape quite a bit to, to feed people here in the way that people want to be fed. And it's tough. We're dry. We're increasingly drier. Um, and, and so it's a, real, it's a real question that does not have easy answers. And whether animal production is better suited for certain areas versus vegetable crop production, um, I, I, I don't know that there's a great answer to that other than take that question to the land. Like, what can the land, what, what is the, the land say? What is earth saying is possible? What does the relationship with place look like? And how does that shape how we come to those answers? Um, yeah, I don't, I think it's hard to, to I think we want one size fits all answers, but that's such a part of the crisis that got us here, right? This Earl Butts, the Secretary of Agriculture that just was like, plant it all fence row to fence row, that's the solution. 
you just got to get it all in production and that that'll that'll you know will win this this mentality of winning like letting agriculture lead us to victory um that war that agriculture has supposedly been fighting has has really damaged quite a bit and so we need something that's really diverse just like we want our soils to be in relationship with diverse species of plants above ground and and organisms below the soil like we need i think our answers need to be diverse as well um, and that's my long-winded non-answer to that question so i'm excited for cody and vel to have the right answer to it well, this closest uh, I've come again, going back to my Mississippi roots that on our farm, um, there were cows, there were a ton of chickens. And here just recently within the past two months, we brought chickens to the purple oasis and we built a uh, tractor or trailer that, what do you call it? Well, we our interns built it and we put the chickens in and we were able to pull them around the garden and they can fertilize different spots. So that's as close as I've come uh, with the oasis of having any animals or chickens on the land. Again, in the South, we have the, the cows and the pigs and those kind of things, but um, that's a new area for me. And we have not come to that point where we have animals and probably will not. We will probably more um, just keep amending our soil, keep not plowing it, not tilling it, um, and putting good compost, you know, into it. Yeah, so um, I guess I'm the one that really has to address the elephant in the room because I raise cattle. <laughs> and 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 I don't do it without thinking about these questions and getting these questions. Um, and, you know, there's, there's lots of responses. Um, you know, we can talk about the importance of protein in a diet and we can talk about uh, utilizing acres that you can't grow food on otherwise, but we're here to talk about regenerative farming. And so th the response that I will give is number one, and I don't know where I heard this comment, but it's not the cow, it's the how, H-O-W, okay? It's not the cow, it's the how. The way that I raise cattle is a net benefit from my research to the environment. We are producing more grass. In the six years that I have been at the Loretta Mother House, we are producing more grass on each and every pasture than there was when I came here. And that is without the use of very much at all uh, synthetic fertilizers or synthetic uh, herbicides, any, any of that kind of thing. It is intensive grazing management where animals are not on the same piece of land for more than three or four days. I can't speak to what it's like in an arid environment. I cannot wrap my head around an area that receives four or five inches of rainfall in a year. I don't know how you grow anything in that kind of an environment. <laughs> if we don't get four inches a month, I'm panicking. <laughs> so, so in our area where I am at, we can grow beef or pork or name the livestock product we can grow those kinds of food products in coordination with other food products. We can also utilize areas that you can't grow uh, lettuce or spinach or green beans or any of those kinds of things on because uh, you've got half an inch of soil on top of a rock, but a little bit of grass will grow right there. And with intensive managed grazing, we can deposit some plant litter on the ground. We can build an organic matter based on the soil and we can improve the soil, get more plants growing, get more roots in the ground. And as you saw on the video, what does roots in the ground means? What do deep roots in the ground mean? You're putting carbon in the soil. 
And so, again, I'll come back to it. It's not the cow, it's the how. Thanks. Um, we have a couple of other um, very point, um, different, um, differently focused questions. So one is, um, um, someone wrote me earlier today and said the video was great, but it was all about large scale agriculture. And what do I do in my backyard? I have a corner of my backyard where nothing grows. Um, and the soil looks like it's been um, seriously compromised. So what do I do? What is regenerative? Um, what do these regenerative practices mean in my backyard? I think one of the one of the solutions, solutions even the wrong word there, but I'll stick with it for now. I think I think one response to that would be find find some way to cover that, right? preferably without you know putting concrete down, but maybe there's some way to cover that soil. That's that's such a basic principle um, and accessible, especially for homeowners. Um, of if you've got something where 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 the soil maybe has been compromised, where it's just nothing seems to grow, maybe there's something that you could do in that space to cover it. And it could be any number of creative things, but I think one of the things that that butts up against is the um, visual appeal. And I think one of the things that um, uh, that this film really kind of butts up against is the way we're used to doing things may not be the way we can keep moving forward. Now, that's certainly the case in, in agriculture in the West. The way we thought we were supposed to do so. I mean, there is something ingrained in farmers to look at straight rows with bare soil that just supposed to feel good. And, and it does. And I don't know how that happened to me because I didn't grow up with that, but I still see that and I go, oh, that's a good looking field. Like somehow that is embedded in our systems. And so it takes the ability to see things differently. And so maybe it's spending a couple of years where all you're doing it on that little patch of, of land is getting some good straw and putting that on top of it, getting some leaf litter, you know, raking up all your grass clippings and putting that over on that pot pile and just keeping that, that ground covered. And as that happens, that matter that, you know, the leaves and the grass or the straw are going to start decomposing. And in that process, life is life going to return is to that soil. And it might take a couple of years, but that's, that's how regenerative systems work. That's how we see, um, the land that's how we see earth take care of itself when we aren't intervening um, and so that's what i that's what i would do i would look to what what can you do what can you bring in to cover that space and really tend to that area be tender with that area if it's damaged be gentle with it don't expect it to all of a sudden turn around and produce a beautiful garden it it's it's maybe wounded it's hurt it needs some care. And that would be the first thing I would do. And also with food uh, scraps in uh, the cooking classes that we do, we talk about a no waste policy, that nothing is wasted, that the ends of your, if you don't make a stock, a vegetable stock out of the ends of your carrots, your celery, your uh, onion peels, whatever that you can compost, keep it in the fridge until you have enough or keep it well, you have to keep it in there so that it doesn't smell and then compost it. Or if you juice, instead of taking the um, peels and things from the juice, whatever you have left over, put it in your compost pile, put it in your uh, small garden patch or even inside window gardening is what uh, many of the people in the community do. They grow herbs and um, say tomatoes in the windowsill but they take the scraps and they use it um, 
it's a compost with leaf mulch. And that also helps in a small space, small backyard. And we've seen where people have had wonderful greens and beans and tomatoes. And as you said, it doesn't happen overnight. You know, you start out with something that you think that it's not um, good soil. And in a year or two, you know, you have everything growing um, that um, you put in the ground. So that's another uh, method to use. Yeah, <clears throat> my response would be um, that that life begets life and you're not going to get life there until you get some life there. And so I would I would do some sort of uh, composting or uh, something to get something growing. And it may just be an annual that you get growing in the first place and do a practice that I've used in our garden, which is composting in place. And so you grow a uh, high nitrogen content legume type cover crop, you know, crimson clover or hairy vetch or something along those lines. Maybe you mix in uh, some radishes or some kind of brassica uh, to, to try and get some roots down into that soil. But, uh, you know, we don't just educate other people. We also have to educate the soil and teach the soil that, hey, you can, you can thrive better if you have roots in you. And whenever you get some roots into that soil, those microorganisms are going to come back to that space. The life is going to beget more life, and that soil will then uh, be able to, to, to grow something and be a covered space and be a productive space. Great. Uh, one participant is wondering if any of you have um, participated in forest farming or know much about forest farming that you could share with the rest of us? And if the answer is no, that's okay. I know. Well, as those on the Farm and Land Committee know, we're going to be trying some. <laughs> we're going to be doing a, uh, a practice called Silvo Pasture, um, which is, is, is a, a type of forest farming. Um, so we're going to be taking an area that was planted in native uh, hardwood trees that was not a thriving uh, area so that the trees did not thrive. And so it's not really going to take off as a forest anytime in the near future. And so we're going to go in there and plant some forage grasses and graze our livestock in and amongst those trees. Um, so ask me again in about three or four years and I'll be able to give you some some do's and don'ts. Okay, the last um, question that I want to present to you all and um, Angela Rakes, our um, education and outreach coordinator here at the Loretto Mother House is going to um, wind up uh, the evening for us with um, some more thoughts along this line, but I want to also present the question to um, the three of you. Um, we've learned a lot about what farmers can do in order to heal the soil and heal the planet, but what should we as community members um, be focused on? What is, what is our role if we aren't actively farming? I would say information, to share information, um, Stephen mentioned about being the gatekeeper of information. There's so much information that's out there and you're absolutely correct. Many times um, there's a fee to obtain this information or it's given in an, in an area that it's not accessible to many people. So I would say that um, the information should be available in the communities where it could be used and where it's needed as opposed to in a location that you have to have transportation to get there and it's not within the community. The information should come into the community where we live and make it easy, easily accessible to us. So information is the key. Once you know better, you do better. Um, a few of the things that I would say First and foremost, build a relationship with farmers. They don't necessarily even have to be doing everything just like you'd like them to like to see them doing it. Because as we said earlier, there's no one size fits all approach. And 
farmers do the best that they know how. So if you can build a relationship with that farmer, ask them questions about why they are doing things the way that they are doing things. What are the impacts of practice X or practice Y? Have a conversation about it. Number one, you are learning. Hopefully they are learning. Number two, you're supporting their business. So they're going to listen to you. And through that relationship, each of you are going to come out better in the end. And hopefully through that relationship, each of you are able to come to a better understanding about the way that farming can and will be done in a regenerative manner. Um, and I'll also say that to anybody that is a landowner that does not farm um, and someone else farms on your land to build that relationship. And if that farmer is not willing to come and to come along and compromise and, and see things in a different way, um, if they're still using tillage and they are, are not willing to discuss some of these things, find somebody else. There, there are people out there that want to do these practices. I would like to have a farm of my own where I can do these practices. Um, but it is really difficult to compete with the commercial farming system and farmers that are in that commercial farming system. So find a farmer build a relationship and going forward, I think that is the best thing for impl implementing regenerative farming on a large scale. Uh, those are great. Yeah, I just echo Val and Cody there. I think I'd like to just also speak about that question because I think it's a it's an important question in a way that we might not consider on face value. Because one of the things that's happened over the last 50, 70 years in in our in our country here, and we've done a good job of exporting it um, with our agricultural practices around the world, is 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 helped people forget that they're a part of the agricultural system that we've we've moved few uh, we've moved more and more people off of the farm and as a result of that it's left it's left more and more people feeling like they're not a part of agriculture but the reality is every time you eat you're participating in agriculture. But it's muddy to be able to track what agriculture you're participating in. The dominant culture likes things not easily traced. We like commodity where one thing is not supposed to be any different than anything else. Um, so it can be hard as a consumer to find out, find those farmers that Cody's talking about um, who want to farm differently. But it's, it's imperative for all of us to be looking for those things. Um, so what do you look for? Because it's not always visible. Maybe you find someone that advertises that they sell at a farmer's market or some local market as a regenerative farmer. And if you can find those, that that's, makes it real easy. It's a lot harder if you're um, in an urban area, a peri-urban area where you don't have a lot, of, um, a lot of choice. It's a lot harder when you are on a limited income to be able to make these choices. And I think, Val, what you said about that information piece is important because we, we as individuals can't, can't change the system that is set in place if we want to change the whole system as one individual. 
It takes a community mindedness to do this. So I don't have an answer to the question other than to say, to encourage you, whoever is willing to sit with the question with other people, go find some, maybe some people, you know, on this call tonight and talk more about it with them. Let the answers be difficult to come to. And in that process of really sitting with it, I'm, I'm confident that solutions will come because this isn't something that needs to like, we, we may have some different experience with it, but I'm, but if you're here tonight, I'm, you, you already have had some access to what might be possible. Um, and so I just want to encourage you, like take that as an encouragement of let the difficult questions like wrestle with it longer. Don't be too quick to find a quick answer um, and do it in community. It's not something that can be done well in isolation. So find a friend who's willing to sit, have a cup of tea and, and, and question aloud together. You know, what could we do? Is there anybody in our area doing this sort of thing? How do I even go about finding it? Um, and I'll give you a little tip. If you're trying to find out some information, because I think this, this fits across our, our country, is we have an agricultural extension service. Every state in our country has a, a university that's called the land grant university. And it's in the inception of all of these 50 land grant universities. The explicit goal is to do research and give that research back to the community. Now, I'll be honest, having gone to a land grant university, there's a lot of shady stuff that goes on and it can be difficult for new systems to, to make their way accessible to everybody. But one thing you can do as a consumer is find out, you can just do a Google search of whatever state you're in, type in, you know, for me, it's Colorado Extension Service. Find the one in the county that's, that you, you reside in, pick up the phone, make a phone call and saying, hey, I, I watched this film about regenerative agriculture. Do y'all know anyone in the county that's doing this sort of thing? And that's their job. And if enough of you in one area start saying, hey, we're really interested in this, then that's going to put something in their air of going, reaching out to the farmers and saying, hey, we're getting a lot of public uh, questions about this whole regenerative agriculture thing. What do y'all think about it? Um, that, that's one way that it can help move information to the farmers and help move some of this, this stuff along. Um, but do it in community. Don't try and do it alone. Excellent idea. Excellent mm -hmm. suggestion. I really appreciate that, Stephen. I'm always talking about calling our representatives and you know elected leaders, and I've never thought about calling my ag extension agent and saying to her that, this is important to me. So that's a really great idea. Thank you. Um, before we move to Angela to look a little bit more at the community piece, I just want to take a moment to thank each of you, Vel and Cody and Stephen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for being willing to wrestle with these hard questions that don't have answers, clear answers. Um, and we're just very grateful for your time and your participation this evening. So thank you very much. Um, I'm going to turn now to Angela Rakes, who is our education and outreach coordinator here at the Loretto Mother House, to help us look a little bit more about how can we um, build this value of regenerative agriculture into our community fabric and what can we do to help our communities um, move toward um, demanding more or, or asking for more um, regenerative ag. So Angela, Susan is going to spotlight you and please share with us your ideas. Welcome. Hello everyone. Um, my lighting's a little bit off. I am outside. Um, so as Jesse said, my name is Angela Rakes. Um, for those of you who don't know me, yes, I am Cody's wife. Um, I also work at the mother house and I'll put a little plug in. You'll see bes behind me our lovely um, pumpkin wagon. We are in the midst of pumpkin season. That's one of the local crops uh, we are toying with right now. Um, 
so I want to thank you all, first of all, for being with us tonight. Um, we've been working for a while to plan this, and we appreciate your all's interest. We appreciate your questions. And I really appreciate the panelists and the diverse viewpoints um, that all of you all brought tonight. Thank you for that. And Jesse, you did steal my thunder a little bit um, with your <laughs> with your last question. Um, honestly, they covered a lot of what I was gonna say, but I'll try to wrap it up um, a little bit. So we each play a very important role in supporting regenerative agriculture, whether we're, the, we're farmers who are actually, you know, out there um, doing it, whether we're growing a backyard garden, we've got a, some backyard chickens, or we're just consumers purchasing our food, we all play a role in this. So one thing I really wanna encourage you all is to focus on your local level. Look at localization, visit a local farmer's market next to you, talk to the farmers. We, as a general rule, we love to talk about how we grow our food. Ask if you can visit their farm or if they just have a, you know, a one acre backyard where they grow a garden, ask if you can visit it and get involved in the way that your food is grown. Ask them if they know till, ask them about their use of th synthetics. Don't be afraid to reach out to your local farmers and build those relationships with them. We've talked a lot about relationships and as consumers, it's so important for us to build those relationships and learn more about where our food comes from. I loved what Vale said about, you know, you can grow herbs and tomatoes of your own. Um, experiment with something like that if that's something you're interested in. Get your toes, you know, into it a little bit yourselves. Um, and I'll also say that as regenerative farmers, we cannot be successful growing our products if we do not have a market. We can grow as much grass finished beef as the land will allow, but if we don't have consumers who will purchase those products, um, then it's really all for naught. So um, my main call to action is to reach out, um, support those local farmers, um, find those who are growing your beef in a way that aligns with your values. Um, look for pasture raised products. Don't get so caught up on things like organic or cage free that may still mean that tillage is happening or that um, those chickens are still in some form of confinement. Um, think about your communities. You know, do you live in an area where maybe you have someone down the street who does grow their own, you know, raise their own chickens and has eggs? Um, how can you partner with them? Can you do work share um, and, and different things like that too? Um, you know, Stephen especially talked a little bit about how it's hard for those. Um, who maybe do not have the financial resources to afford local food, which as a general rule um, is usually more expensive. Um, so look at work share, um, work share relationships, things like that. Um, and I really liked what Stephen said too about a community level. Um, so I wanna challenge you all too, to think about the organizations that you're involved in. Um, are there local restaurants that you really love to support? Can you have conversations with them about supporting local farmers and supporting regenerative farmers. Um, for those in the Loretto community, um, can you work with um, others in the community to make sure the kitchens um, that you're eating from are, are using local food um, and, and things like that. So work you can work on it on an individual level, um, but also think about the organizations you're involved in and how those organizations can also have an impact. Once again, I wanna thank you all um, for coming tonight. And I put it up toward the very top of the chat um, and I will put it down again, but we do have a farm Facebook page that Jesse mentioned. Um, I will also put my email in the chat. If anyone wants to reach out to me um, to talk about any of this further, I am education and outreach coordinator. Um, so this is uh, kind of the bread and butter of a lot of what I do. So feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions. Thank you. Thanks, Angela. I want to just take a moment to thank all of the organizers for tonight's evening. This was, like I said, a collaborative event between the Loretto Earth Network and the Farm and Land Management Committee. So um, Susan Claussen, Angela Rakes, Beth Blissman, and I were the organizers. So thank you to each of you for all of the work that you did in making this night possible. I want to end with a quote from the film. Um, uh, it was one of the farmers who was interviewed and she um, was talking about how we are all in this together, how what I plant and what I eat affects you down the road, affects you across the oceans. Um, we are all intimately connected on this planet. And so what is it that we can do today 
so that future generations can flourish in the abundance of what we've created by our decisions. And we are all decision makers. So at whatever level you are a decision maker, if it's what you eat tonight when you go home, if it's what you plant, if it's what you buy, what is it that you can do today so that future generations will flourish in the abundance of what was created by our decisions? Thank you all for coming. I hope you've enjoyed this evening. We've loved having you and this will be available on the Loretto Community website and YouTube page, like I said. So just keep your eyes open for it and you can watch it a million more times. Thanks, have a great evening. <laughs>